What up, what up, what up? It's Ibn Webb, Ibn Webb, Quran or some. Another go around with this official thanks. Got an Essex County all day edition I'm doing again. They talk about superheroes, people you just hear about. You know, um, Troy, he's much older than me, um, but in the same breath, just hearing stories just about some of the things that he's done, you know, with his life, you know, on the court, off the court, what have you here. It's just like, wow. You know, uh, to just be fortunate enough to just um, have an opportunity to one to meet him and just um, hear his story. Like I said, I'm I'm just so you know forever grateful for all of this here. So you know, enough for me just um, with this little intro here. I'm just gonna get to Troy and we just gonna um, talk shop. Hold tight. Hey, hey Troy, nice to meet you, man. I'm I'm up here. Dad. Thank you, thank you so much uh, for taking time out of your day to do this. Like I said, I'm totally just just taken back by this and just, um, I don't know, like I said, just the excitement. I try to keep it inside me, but at least I wanted to share that. I'm, I'm like overly excited and just happy to have you on. And like I said, I um, you, everybody else, this has just been like a blessing here and I'm just so fortunate. So, you know, I'm gonna stop with my babbling because I'm really about to get into babble mode, but I just wanted to say thank you for just taking time out again here so um how you doing i'm good man first let me uh let me thank you for uh, reaching out to me and uh giving me an opportunity to uh share my story um i, I actually had the opportunity to listen to some of the other guys before me and uh what, what a pleasure it is to hear you know people's stories man about you know how they got into the game and you know where they are where they at right now so it's, uh, I'm, I'm actually, I'm honored to be a part of this program, man. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, the pleasure's all mine. I know we're not going to go back and forth exchanging pleasantries, but like I said, the honor is all mine here. With that being said, I know um, you talked about seeing some of the other guys here, but where everything start for you as far as where you, were you born in Jersey? You born elsewhere, it came up. How'd everything go down? So, you know, like most people, you know, I'm born, I was born and raised in Newark, you know, okay. like Beth is your hospital, like most people who come <laughs> out of Newark. Um, I came out of the Little Bricks, though, you know, I don't know if you guys are familiar with the Little Bricks, you know. Over Turner, over Turner, yeah. over there. Yeah, yeah, that's the, that's my original stopping ground. My, uh, my parents uh, lived in the, uh, in the projects, like we used to call them, Little Bricks. And I lived there for a while. Then my mother and father, um, you know, like most people migrated out of the projects and into a home. But okay. we still stayed in that Northeast Orange area. But uh, but I'm, I always tell people I'm from the Low Bricks. So that's where I originally came from. Mm -hmm. and, uh, that's where most of my family members are from. So I'm from North. Okay. Born okay. Raised. Born and raised. Well, um, well um, as far as activities, your average childhood, typical childhood, like everybody else playing, this and that, or? You know. Yeah, well, you know, in the you know, in the projects, you know, you played a little bit of everything. You played baseball, you played football, wasn't much grass to play football on. And I actually played football and broke my uh hip playing football, mm -hmm. actually my pelvis playing football on concrete grass type of thing. Mm -hmm. So um so I played a lot, I played more football like most people do. You start out playing football. And uh, then you pick up another sport, baseball, then there's basketball, you know, it's little stuff like that, you know, playing in the projects. That's how I started playing sports, right there and there. Yeah, did uh, you gravitate to one more than the other? I know ultimately, obviously, you play basketball, but I don't know if football or baseball was your thing and you just uh, forced to play basketball because you was that talented? I mean, no, I wasn't that talented. So I actually was, a, as a kid, I was a better football player. Okay. I was a better football player because when you have an older brother, he kind of make you tougher than you really want to be. So when you used to fight your older brother, you know, he's toughing you up. So I, I enjoyed playing football because I enjoyed the physical contact. Um, I really wasn't into basketball. Uh, I would say probably maybe fourth, fifth grade, I got into liking basketball, but it was mostly football was my sport. Uh, cause I enjoy playing for, I enjoy the physical contact more so than anything. So that was my sport. I actually thought I was going to be a football player. Okay. That was my goal. Yeah. What positions did you, uh, the player like? Defensive end. Okay. Oh, so you like hitting people, getting the quarterback. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I, I hear you. I, <laughs> I hear yeah, you. I enjoy hitting people, man. Did you have the opportunity to, um, 
play in any leagues uh, prior pre high school, whether it's basketball, uh, sports, or anything like that? Yeah, so we moved up into the Velsburg area. So I played at Velsburg Park Football okay. League. Um, mm -hmm. Played there for a number of years, and um, just you know, just played football for a number of years and got you know got into the game, and then all of a sudden basketball started becoming a little more interesting than me and to me then I started to start switching to sports and I stopped playing football to play basketball because I was still able to be physical and still play the game at the same time okay. so that's what really pushed me towards the basketball part of it nah. and then obviously you know you had um decision to make as far as even growing up in you know high school and all that how did you choose going to the valley versus anywhere else um, well, actually, while I, while I was even in grammar school, I played baseball and I ran track. Okay. So, because my dad was a track guy too, so I've uh, picked up that sport through my father, because my father used to kind of take us out and do, make us run the neighborhood, so my dad was a cross-country guy, so I've learned how to run cross-country by being with my father, so, okay. and I played, played baseball because it was just something else to do while I was in grammar school. Um, as far as LA and the Valley, you know, back in those days, you know, coaches kind of like came to your games and kind of asked you, you know, what high school you were going to back then. Okay. You know, Seton Hall was uh, actually um, uh, trying to get me to come to Seton Hall prep. Um, St. Benedict's was another school that uh, had, uh, had used to come to, to the elementary games and see uh, the young athletes play. And, um, you know, Ted, Fru Ted Fiori also came out once in a while. He sent his assistant coaches out. And um, I think the Valley was just, more, probably was the best opportunity for me as far as playing basketball wise. Uh, I've watched Ted Fiori coach um, uh, Marvin Wiggins and Tony Season and those other guys and Jerome Anderson, those guys who came before me. So I kind of watched uh, Valley played in the county tournament one year, and then actually that was the year they won it. And then um, I just made it, made the decision a little more easier because I wanted to be a part of like a winning program. Which you know, I'm not saying the other schools didn't have that, but Valley just had that kind of uh, you know you want to be a part of it uh, team type type of environment. So that's why I chose Alley to Valley. Yeah, uh, interesting. I mean, even. You mentioned the whole quote unquote the recruit, and that's been going on for eons. I mean, you know, you know, I mean, they, you know, they play, they play the role, come to little grammar school games and find out who your parents are or who's your caregiver and all, you know, they know how to work it. That, that hasn't, that's, that hasn't changed. It's got more evolved and more a little intricate and more slick, but it's still been the same stuff. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, Valley to me, you know, like I said, uh, it was a, it was a great decision for me to go there because act, it prevented, it presented an opportunity for me to play right away. Okay. So um, that was very attractive to me, you know, like, ah, I could actually get a chance to play right away. Uh, that wasn't kind of explained to me, but I saw the opportunity for me to play right away. I, I saw the guys that were there before me, mm -hmm. and I felt that if I went to Alley to Valley, I could beat those guys out of that spot, and I could uh, play a significant amount of time if I had gone to Valley opposed to going to the other schools. Nah, it makes sense. So, so you get there. You mentioned playing right away, but you got all the other adjustments you got to make. You from traveling to school, getting back and forth, and, and everything else. Your high school and your teenage years, all that fun stuff here. You know that kind of goes with being a teenager. You get to you get to Valley, and you say and play right away. Now, are we talking varsity or? Yeah, I started varsity as a freshman. Okay, I'll leave the Valley. Um... The transition, the transition of playing basketball at the Valley wasn't that difficult for me because um, my father groomed me as a kid um, to play at that level at a young age. So when I, when guys were in the sixth and seventh, eighth grade, and they were playing against their own peers. I actually was playing against my father and his friends. So. That's why the game was, I enjoyed the physical part of the game because I grew up playing basketball with my dad at a very young age and his friends. So getting knocked around wasn't a big thing to me. So when I was able to go to high school 
and play against high school guys who were, you know, much older to me, big to me. It, it wasn't difficult for me because I had the experience in the sixth, seventh, and eighth grade from my dad taking me around to all the parks um, and introducing me to his friends and other players. And I was the, the, the small kid out there, but, uh, but it, made me, it made me actually stronger and bigger than most, most of my peers when I got into high school. So the basketball part was in the difficult part, was transitioning from elementary school to high school as a freshman and being in the starting position was really overwhelming, to be honest with you. It was really, it was a lot to take in as a freshman. Yeah, I can only imagine that. How was the upperclassmen towards you? I mean, again, you're starting, so there's a level of respect there, but there's probably some jealousy for some some animosity a little bit. Like, how did all that play out? Well, um, well, Ted Fury didn't really allow a lot of that um, stuff in his uh, in his gym. Um, you earn your spot. I mean, that's pretty much the way he ran this organization. Uh, it wasn't given to me. So, I mean, there were some upperclassmen that probably – Felt they should have been playing over me, but nah, it was uh it was about who was the who could put the ball in the basket, who could grab the rebounds, who could stop players. That's all Ted Fury Fury cared about. And actually it was my teammate Jerry Glitcher was a sophomore. So I was 14 years old. Jerry Glitcher was 15. And we were playing against like uh Roman Catholic my freshman year. We played Orange High School, which was number one in the state at the time. We was playing East Orange. We playing back. We playing a lot of North schools, and um, I actually had so much respect for Ted Fury because I was saying, "How can you take a 14 year old and a 15 year old yeah. and win basketball games with those two young young guys?" And somehow he motivated uh, not only me but the other my other teammates to perform at a level that I actually never ever ever experienced as a freshman. This guy had me doing things that I didn't think I was capable of doing, but he just somehow motivated me to become a better player and a better person when I was out there on that court. That's a sign of a great coach. They see something in you that you don't see, and then ultimately you see it. Yeah, yeah it, was, uh, it, was, it was a unique situation. I mean, it was for me to even to think like that, I was like, man, this is – I'm in the county tournament playing a championship game against Orange High School, the number one team in the state. Yeah. And I'm jumping center mm -hmm. as, as a freshman. And uh, it, was, it was just so exciting to be in Seton Hall University at the time. The uh, Walsh Gym. Yeah, the Walsh Gym. Yeah, as a freshman playing in the championship game against uh, Orange High School, Rob Cole, Curtis Cole, Darren Hammond. I mean, I think Billy Coleman. I mean, they had so many great players. And I was out there with them, and I, I I don't know how I kept my composure to be honest with you. I, I really don't know, but I think it was the coach mm -hmm. somehow who managed to keep me under control as a freshman to be in that environment and uh, to be successful during that time. So it, it was I, interesting. You remember how you did that game? I had 14 points that game, man, as a freshman, and yeah. um, it was it was exciting. Um, it was really exciting to, to be out there as a freshman, the only freshman in, on the court, and to be a part of cutting down a net yeah. at, uh, at a championship game. It was, I, I, just, I was on another level at that point in time um, when I was uh, out there with my teammates cutting that net down. I, I still have the video of that game where I watched from time to time. Okay. Uh, yeah, so I just I get it, you know. I show my 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 grandkids and my kids. They mm -hmm. hate when I sit down. and Say you gotta watch this. Thing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Wow, no, no, that that that's that's something. Just to even be a freshman to to be out there, you cutting nets down and just being a fresh. Like I mean, I can only imagine. I can't even imagine that. You know, just the temperament. I mean, obviously when you got home, you still had to take the garbage out, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. My oh, okay. My dad didn't care about uh, uh, whether you won a championship. My father was in a, had a military background, so it was uh, you marched to one beat. So that's right. That's right. <laughs> yeah. Now, yeah. even how how does that work? Even like back then, even in the summertime, I mean, you know, obviously it wasn't no AAU circuits. But what did you do, like off season wise, to, to um, kind of stay in shape? Elmwood Park was uh, 
was a big thing for me back in those days, Elmo Park. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if you, anyone ever mentioned Ron Saladin, called him Atari. Atari, no, I'm familiar yeah. with Atari. Yeah, Atari used to have his leads. Mm -hmm. So I used to play for Atari from time to time. Actually, I, I, Atari used to pick me up okay. to, go, to go play with him, uh, play with his team, and in in, actually in Jersey City. So, I mean, guys like Ron, Ron Saladin, Mr. Miles, Mm -hmm. Mike McNair, Mr. Hinton, I could go to Mr. Oliver, another guy, Mr. Oliver, who was very instrumental in my um, my basketball career during the off seasons. Um, you know, there was there was the, um, the youth games. Do you remember that? Yeah, I remember youth games. Yes. Yeah. So that I played in that as I played in youth game when I was in the eighth grade. I okay. actually I actually traveled. I made the team as an eighth grader to go to Connecticut. Mm -hmm. to play in the um, in the youth games. It was like the Junior Olympics. Right. Yeah, so I was in the eighth grade going to Connecticut to play with James Giss, Derek Williams. I think Darren Hammer was on, on that team. Uh, I think Cole might have been on that team as well. Kenny Macklin was the basketball coach at the time. Okay. When I was in the eighth grade going yeah. to, yeah, yeah, I was in the yeah. eighth grade going to the, connect, to the youth games to play basketball. So it was fascinating. I was so I was actually was I, so I like to say I was prepared mm -hmm. for that to play at the next level at a young age because of the exposure that I had to the game. That was it your first time playing out of state, out of state competition in the youth games, or you've done it before? Um, I've done it before that. We've uh, Mr. Miles. I don't know if you're familiar with the little lads. Little lads. I play little lads with Mr. Okay. Miles. All those guys. Yeah. Yeah, Mr. Miles. Uh, so let me, let me tell you a unique story about Mr. Miles. I'm gonna try not to get emotional, but I'm gonna tell you a story. <clears throat> so it was, um, we, were, we were trying out, I went to a parochial school at uh, even in, in the seventh and eighth grade as well. I was in the uh, parochial school from fifth to the eighth grade. And Mr. Miles had um, um, watched me play in the, the uh, parochial or parochial A league. And, you know, he asked me to come play with him one year. So I played with Mr. Miles for one year. And then they were having, um, East Orange was having a, um, a tryout for the little lads. And uh, so Mr. Miles came up to me before the tryouts. He said, I'm going to tell you something. They don't want you here. Uh, hmm. I was like, well, why not? He's like, because uh, you're, not, you're, not you're not from the same schools as these guys. So you got to go out there and play twice as hard. So I did that. And that, honestly, I tell you, he was one of the few coaches that, you know, could come to me and motivate me, say certain things to me to get me to play a different way. And I wound up winning um, New Jersey Mr. Little Lad. And Mr. I won Mr. Little Lad. Yeah, I remember. Yeah, that. I wound up winning Mr. Little Lad for the whole tournament. And, and I all owe that to Mr. Miles, who took time out of his schedule to bring me to this league where no other coaches was would have gave, given me the opportunity. Mr. Miles brought me into that, that league. And that from that point on, my confidence grew even more because Mr. Miles, Mr. Miles said, you know, I told you you could do it and I knew you would do it, but I knew you would push yourself. And those were the exact words to me. You have to play harder than everybody else. And I just kept that mentality ever since then. Nah, great man. Now back then, did they play it down there on Trenton, like Hamilton? They played it down there? Played in Hamilton, and then we went to PA. Okay. For the National Championship. Okay. Yeah. No, nah, no, nah, I definitely remember Little Lads, and I. And it's interesting that you said that you played, too. So now nah, the East Orange ties, I definitely, definitely remember all that stuff here. So you, freshman year, sophomore, so, I mean, again, like, obviously, I mean, county champs. How did you guys do in, in the States? Uh, freshman year, we won our division. So okay. my freshman year, I won the county and state championship as a freshman. Okay. Um, sophomore year, we lost the um, we lost the championship in the ECT. I believe it was to Weekway. Okay. Uh, Slappy White uh, was, I believe, was the coach at the time, Mr. Artie Jones. Mm -hmm. um, and they had some great teams back then. Yeah. Um, one of the things I did, I always enjoyed playing against the North teams mm -hmm. because the North teams and anybody who played at Orange always enjoyed playing against the East Orange and the North teams. Mm -hmm. And, but something about 
playing against the North teams that always motivated me because I was from North. And my dad worked in this North school system. So I had, yeah, even, yeah. <laughs> I had another reason to uh, motivate myself to, uh, to play hard. So uh, when we lost a week where it was really, it was, it was tough, you know, tough for me and tough for my dad too, because he had to go back and face his fellow uh, coworkers. So. Yeah. <laughs> No, nah, no, nah, I could totally see that, especially back then too, because I know they had the, the city league going on and everything, and just to kind of just all those teams just depending on the year, you just never know who would come out of all that stuff. So I can totally see the excitement playing against Newark. And like you said, you being from there and obviously your dad, you know, working in the schools. So I know it was some, some bragging rights, you know, so some more water cooler conversations that probably got a little heated, you know. So now nah, I could I could definitely see that here. Then I know Valley closes, correct? Yeah, Valley closes, and um, I had a couple of choices. Uh, Seton Hall Prep was on the list, St. Benedict's, and um, East Orange High, okay. and um, Clifford Scott. And I honestly, I didn't, I didn't want to go to any more Catholic schools, man. I was just, I, I, I had it with. Uh, with that environment and I just wanted to do something different and I wanted to uh, play a different type of basketball. Okay. And um, my dad, you know, was in charge of where I was going to go. Mm -hmm. um, so he, you know, he made the decision that Clifford Scott <clears throat> would have been the best situation for me. Although I, I did want to actually be a part of that East Orange great history. Yeah. basketball yeah. guys who came out of East Orange High and uh, went on to accomplish great things. I, I honestly tell you, I did want to be a part of that because I, I grew up playing ball in East Orange, so I wanted to be a part of, I wanted to be a part of that history too. Mm -hmm. But my, my dad thought that um, Clifford Scott was the best opportunity for me. And beside my other teammates had gone there, Andre Adams, okay. uh, who played with me at the Valley, mm -hmm. Mike Brown, Brown, yes. Also played with me at Alameda Valley, and um, made the trip over to Clifford Scott because it was there. It was both of those guys last year, so um, the decision for me was even easier when I knew those two guys were going to go to Clifford Scott and play ball, and um, and then also have an opportunity to play for Coach Times, who I watched uh, at Seton Hall University, um, who was guard oriented, and I knew I. I knew at the Alameda Valley, I had played a lot with my back to the basket um, at the Valley. And when I knew if I went to Coach Times, he would actually have me facing the basket. And I, and I wanted to, I wanted to face the basket. I was tired of having my back to the basket. And I thought if I would have gone to St. Benedict or Seton Hall Prep, my career would have been real short, um, being 6'4", playing a power forward. Um, so Times pre presented the the best opportunity for me as far as basketball uh, yeah. was concerned. Now, you guys, you said yourself, Mike Brown, Andre Addict, you guys fall in Coach Tyne's lap pretty much, you know, with Valley Close. That, what a blessing. I mean, that's 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 a hell of a gift to get, you know. Well, with that being said, y'all just, y'all go right from the beginning. It sounds like y'all don't even play around as far as what I needed to accomplish and the team. Was it easy to gel? I know you mentioned coming out of Catholic school and going to public school, I mean, was it was it easy transition for you? No, it wasn't. Um, <laughs> it's a uh, parochial school and, and public school was two different environments. Um, for one, we could never leave the facility. You, once you got in there, you were there. There was no leaving to go off campus to get, you know, your lunch or anything. And um, the schools were much smaller than um, the public schools. And um, so it was different for me. It was, I had to get used to the environment, used to the folks. I, I wore a uniform to school every single day. So uh, the dress code was totally different. Um, the people the people welcomed me. I can honestly say that the people definitely welcomed uh, all three of us in the school. We didn't have any issues with that. But it was just a different transition. Um, the classrooms were a little bigger than the uh, private school. So I had to get used to a lot of that stuff and get used to the, to the system of changing classes and going from one end of the building to the other building, having a lunch and having a study hall. That's, that's stuff we didn't have at, at uh, Alameda Valley. It was, you had one lunch and everything else was all class. So it was a, the transition for the education was a, definitely a challenge for me 
my first year there. Yeah. So what was the buzz like as far as basketball season that junior year? I'm sure there was a little buzz going around there. Well, I mean, Clifford Scott had some um, great players, you know, prior to us even coming there. I mean, I honestly, I think we just filled the gap, to be honest with you. Uh, Coach Tyne had a team that was successful. Um, he had, a, I, I, I honestly thought there was some great players. I mean, we fought every single day for a position. Mm -hmm. um, I wasn't guaranteeing anything. Mike probably was the only one that was guaranteed anything because he was 6'8". Yeah. Yeah. So you didn't have too many 6'8 guys sitting on the bench, especially mm -hmm. when this is last year in high school. So, But as far as Andre Adams and myself, we had to earn our spots. And Clifford J. Scott, I, to this day, I still said they had some, some great ball players on that team. Um, you know, I just, I, I just maybe just worked, up, worked a little harder and, you know, maybe earned a spot where somebody else might have had it. But for the most part, um, it, was, it was tough. It was no guarantee that we were going to start. That was promised to us. Like I said, maybe Mike Brown might have had a guaranteed job. Yeah, but, yeah. <laughs> yeah but I, I know I did not have a, a guaranteed job. Mm -hmm. But I knew I was going to be uh, facing the basket. So that whole summer, I just worked on my ball handling and my jump shot and being able to drip, shoot off the dribble. That was a, a big part of my training over the summer. So I knew going into my junior year at Clifford Scott, I was going to prove that I could play with my um, uh, play facing up instead of with my with my back to the basket. And, and to me, that was my critical year as far as getting college coaches to look at me from a guard as a guard opposed to looking at me as a, as a forward. So I didn't want to go small division one. I wanted to go kind of big division one where I could face, face the basket. So I spent my whole summer prior to going to Scott working on my ball handling and being able to shoot off the dribble. Mm -hmm. Now, obviously that, that hard work pays dividend. I mean, obviously your junior year, senior year and everything, what have you, team-wise you guys do well individually accolades continue to pour in for you here and you mentioned college like just some how was that whole process you mentioned wanting to go potentially you know big time d1 here i mean i know back then too what they just probably had five star summer camps or you know all the, did you do any of the camps uh, all that stuff or you just kind of word of mouth and um elmwood et cetera, et cetera. that's where coaches just start hearing about you uh no i actually uh popolo's invitation was a big camp okay um, I did five star twice. Um, I mean, even back then, five star was so political, you know. If you, so um, I went there as a freshman, and I went to five star my senior year. And between that, I went to the Poconos Invitation um, camp because um, that's all my parents could afford at the time. So five star was really expensive back then, and Poconos Invitation had more of an opportunity for me to play and more get more weeks away from home and developing my basketball game. So that was that was a big part of my summers as well. Okay. Now how'd that impact again as far as we talk about college? What were your choices? I mean, I know you end up at George Washington, but you had any other choices, anything else just um or how did all that work out? Uh, well I mean I I, I was I was heavily recruited. Um uh, so when you have a guy that's six eight on your team, you know college college is going to come and watch him play. I mean, that's, that's, yeah. so I fed off of that. I fed off of uh, Mike's Definitely. size and Mike's ability to attract attract uh, college coaches. So um, I knew if Mike performed well, I would perform well because all the attention would be given to Mike, and that would leave more opportunities for me and other and my other teammates. So a lot of us, believe it or not fed off of Mike's presence because he was so big and so dominant um, back in those days. And in and, and 81, you had a 6'8", six, 6'9", six, guy. Mike was like 240, mm -hmm. you know. Colleges are going to come see him play. So I, I took advantage of Mike's presence uh, to better my opportunity as far as colleges were concerned. So uh, Georgia Tech, Villanova, Syracuse, um, Seton Hall, Rutgers, um, I, DePaul had looked at me. I, 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 I probably could have gone to a lot of big time schools, but George Washington attracted me because Mike Brown was there. 
Um, um, so, yeah, and I also did my, my work as well. I was like, well, who's in front of me? Who mm -hmm. I have to beat out? Right. Um, so that was, that was another reason why I actually uh, attended George Washington University. Also for his academics, it was definitely known for his academics. Um, and the ability to play right away was very important to me because I never enjoyed sitting the bench. Um, I don't know one player that, that does that, but you know, I've always been in the starting role, so I wanted to play right away. I wasn't so much concerned with uh, who I had to beat out. I was just like, I want to play right away. And I want to play with Mike Brown because um, yeah. I knew again, six eight, six nine. Mike grew two more inches, and he became like six ten in college, and he got bigger size wise. So I knew at that level, if they come and see Mike play, I'm definitely gonna get a look. So, and that's when I was thinking more NBA, more so than uh, what my next year was gonna be about. I was like, well, if Mike Brown's dropping 17, 18 points a game, I'm gonna be right behind him. So mm -hmm. I'm gonna feed off of Mike. That was my that was my whole initiative. I'm gonna feed off Big Mike. Yeah. Now nah, that makes sense. And obviously being down and you mentioned academics, you mentioned the playing time. And if you needed some some nightlife, you in DC, you know, so you couldn't go wrong. You couldn't go wrong in that regard. So just how's uh, your family with all this? I mean, they got a they got the they got their son in college. I mean, I'm sure that just had to be a big load just taken off of them all those years, just going, you know, paying for school and this and that. So I I can only imagine just like you know how proud they were of you, just kind of even with that up to that point, and even more, but even definitely up to that point. Well, I was the first one to graduate from college in my family. Yeah. Um, um, I, I don't know if I had a choice or not, whether I was gonna go to college and graduate or not. I think my father already had that in his, in his mind and my mom was like, you're going to college. You know, you gotta, get, you gotta educate yourself. You need a degree, it's gonna better you. It's gonna further you down the road. And I, all those positive things that a college could offer, my parents was in my ear about, um, getting your education, taking advantage of the, of the, of the basketball, mm -hmm. but take advantage of the education because if you can't play anymore, my father used to always, always say that, that ball is going to stop dribbling at some point in time, and then what are you going to do? So that was his message to me daily, uh, even when he came down to see me play. He was like, oh, you're, you're hitting the books. Uh, you stand you stand on top of your studies. You're not going out too much. You're in D.C., you know, it's, it's a lot of stuff to get involved with. No, my, my dad was, he didn't play. Even from a distance, he was monitoring my uh, social life. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, he, he didn't even need social media back then, but he was on you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so, and, and while I was at GW, I actually had the opportunity to go to Spain. Okay. Um, my freshman year, uh, I made the Lanterne Rookie of the Year. My mm -hmm. freshman year, Mike made it the year before me, so... You know, it's just like, you know, playing, you know, playing behind Mike may, gave me a lot of opportunities. So Mike and I both had the opportunity to go to Spain for a month and wow. play um, in Spain. And uh, you're talking about a, a life changing event. It was, uh, it was definitely, like I said, I'm 17, 18 years old. Didn't even know what a passport was. I had to run and get a passport and I'm, I'm on a plane with a bunch of different guys from Atlantic 10. Most of them are all older than me. Um, and I'm just the youngest guy on the, on, on the team. And I'm flying out the country for the first time in my life and, and going to a foreign country, don't speak the language and playing against grown men. We weren't playing against college guys. We were playing against their kind of their semi-pro league guys. So it was a great experience. I'll, I, I will never ever forget that experience that I had leaving this country and going overseas as a freshman in college with a bunch of different guys from the conference and playing against grown, actually grown men, not men, grown men. And just learning and developing my, my skills for when I came back to the States. Nah, that, that's, that's incredible. And, but it puts you to what you talked about earlier, that whole trajectory about wanting to play in the pros. So you figure, you out there, you playing against, you know, grown men, though you've played with your father and his people growing up, you know, but obviously just the pro level and you testing your game, you know, 
you know, altered your game and changed it up. You facing the basket, you doing everything now and to be out there. And it's kind of like, I'm sure, you know, obviously that, that NBA or pro level, that stuff was, you know, starting to, you starting to pick up a little speed thinking about it here. So like, where was you at in regards to obviously back, you know, to the States, you have your rest of your college career, sophomore year, et cetera. Like, when you realize that hey, I can, I could probably do this whole thing. Yeah. So my sophomore year, um, I was I was averaging 17 points a game as a freshman. Mm-hmm. And so going to my sophomore year, um, we didn't have the three point line either at the time. So going to my my, my yeah. sophomore year, I was really hyped up about this is it. I'm going to really step my game up to the next level. And um, unfortunately my teammate got into a scuffle on the court and, and got his jaw broke. Okay. Um, Michael Rowley, uh, guy sucker punched him and broke his jaw. Mm-hmm. So the unfortunate part was that it took me out of my scoring role. So I was, I was the two guard, the shooting guard in college. When Michael Rowley went down, they switched me to the point guard, which dropped my scoring from 17 to like 10 points a game. But the other aspects of my game improved tremendously. So I suffered point-wise, but I learned the game in a different, from a different position. I had to be the guy who, who had to orchestrate all the plays, give the ball up to somebody else to score, which was difficult for me to do because mm-hmm. I was so used to having the ball in my hand and making decisions whether I was going to score or pass. Now I was now I'm the point guard and I'm distributing the ball more than I would like, but it made me a better player in my sophomore year, which prepared me for my junior year. Um, that summer, my sophomore year going into my junior year, I spent my time playing with um, uh, Cleo Hill, okay. my father, mm-hmm. uh, who uh, spent a tremendous amount of time working on my jump shot. Okay. Um, because now I'm now had the experience of playing the point guard. I changed my game from going face the basket. Now I'm facing basket, so I got that down. Now I have the point guard game down. Now Cleo Hill was the guy that was supposed to fine tune my jump shot, and um, he he spent just about most of the summer taking me from park to park, showing me how to shoot the jump shot. He had this thing called the gooseneck. I don't know if you're familiar with that. No, I'm not. I'm not. Okay, so Cleo Hill said, if you when you shoot your shot, at the end of your shot, you have to have like a gooseneck finish. Okay. So if anybody ever trained with Cleo Hill and you didn't have a jump shot because you didn't follow his instructions. He was big on following through gooseneck. That mm-hmm. was his thing. And if you look at a goose, you think about his neck is in the down. Mm-hmm. That's how Cleo Hill taught me how to shoot a jump shot. And he's like, that's how you, when you shoot your jump shot, your hand should always be in that position. And when your hand is not in that position, that ball is not going to go in. And he was right. So he would take me from different parks. I would meet him at Elmwood Park. Then he'd take me parks in Orange. He would make me practice on all different types of rims so I could get used to shooting the ball in different, just like different arenas. So you have right. to get used to that. So Cleo Hill was already preparing me to go back to my junior year and be prepared to go in different environments and still keep that same consistency up with your jump shot. So I spent the whole summer working out with Cleo Hill on my jump shot. How's that jumper when you get back on campus? Well, so I, I the jumpers, the jumpers flowing. Okay. And I can tell you, man, this is where I really think I really got tested as a human being and as an athlete. Mm-hmm. Um, my, my coach and I butt heads. Mm-hmm. So, you know, your coach is the coach is the coach, you know, and we butt head so hard where he felt that I'm a sit you. So uh, he sat me. Mm. So all that work that I put in that whole summer, my junior year, which is the critical point of your basketball career, especially if you're in college, that's that year right before you get to your senior year. And keep in mind, I got Big Mike there on my team 
the pros that come and look at Mike. So they see Mike, they got to see me. Yeah, my, my coach uh, deliberately set me down my junior year. So mm -hmm. I set the bench my junior year when we were playing against Michigan State, Kansas, Virginia. West, we, were playing, we were playing Big Ten school. We were playing, we were playing big time basketball. But I should have been out there. It just felt, nah, I don't, I, 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 you will do it my way, you ain't gonna play. So my junior year, man, it was a, it was a learning experience for me. And that's, that's when that message from my father said, what you gonna do when that ball stop bouncing? Mm -hmm. And at that point in time, I knew that my education was just as important to me than the basketball. So how did I make up for that loss of not playing? How did I, you know, make it through my junior year? I just, I, I knew I wasn't gonna play. He made it clear to me. So I came to practice every day and worked hard, just worked on my individual skills. Um, and I just focused more and more on my academics. And um, it, was, it was a disappointing year basketball wise, but academically it helped me uh, mm -hmm. because I knew I wasn't playing. So I might as well give more and more focus on studying and, and working out on my own and just trying to be prepared for if things ever change. So, and it did, he got fired. Okay. So he got fired that year and, um, and it opened up the door for me for my senior year, which was, uh, which was a big transition for me going from sitting at the bench to now starting and being a guy again. So it was tough, man. That's why I, I tell kids today that you need to educate yourself because this game is not forever. And if mm -hmm. your coach gets a bug, he doesn't like you, or you're not playing as well as you want to, or you're having a bad time, he's going, he's going to sit you. And how you handle it, how you become a man, and how you work yourself back to, you know, where you have some respect for yourself and you keep your confidence, it's really going to depend how prepared you were prior to getting to that point. So I honestly believe that my, my success at that tough time of my career was because I had a strong family um, base. And my, my dad always stayed in my ear, you know, and kept me strong because it was easy for me to say, I'm out, I'm transferring. And I, I contemplated that. I was going to ask you that. Yeah, I was going to ask you that. Yeah. I was going to actually, uh, I, I, was start, I was starting my own recruiting process. I started talking to coaches. Um, uh, I had a friend that was a lawyer who, you know, was, had some connections with other colleges. So I had an opportunity to go, but um, I, I, I wanted to stay. I wanted to, I wanted to finish. I didn't, I didn't want this guy to uh, push me out. I knew I was better than that. And I, I hung in there, man. And it, it, it paid dividends for me. Um, it made me a better person. It made me value education more. Mm -hmm. um, and it made me appreciate my family, man, because uh, it was a struggle being away from home and sitting on the bench and watching guys play that weren't better than you, that couldn't score. It was, it yeah. was tough. I set the bench my junior year, man. I was very devastated, but I pulled through it. Nah, that you did. And I mean, a lot of lessons in that, like you mentioned, you know, um, the business of obviously college athletics, you know, on the politics that tied into that, but just even your own personal growth. I mean, you, you talk about academics, you talk about you, you in college, I've been to college. I know you could get pulled every way here, but, you know, uh, but obviously I think that foundation just from your, from your family just proved dividend there when you needed the most. I mean, they were there for you and, you know, that dark, that dark tunnel eventually became became a light tunnel because it sounded like you said he got fired and you got back to playing. Now, even when you got back to playing, did you did you stay at the one you seen here or you did one, the one and the two? I I, I, um, I I'm sorry. Um, that's you. No, that's that's you. Oh, <laughs> sorry. Nah, it's good. cool. It's cool. Good. Um, yeah, so I, I stayed out. I went back to the two guard. So, okay. you know, the guy who Michael Rowley recovered, uh, he, he went back to his position. I went back to the two guard. Mm -hmm. I went back to averaging 17 points a game. Um, I had a good season. I thought I had a good season. Um, 
I wound up getting drafted by the Nets um, that year. And um, and that that year that I got drafted, and if, if whoever watched this video, if you don't know this name, then you don't know basketball, nor Mo Layton, Dennis Layton, mm-hmm. um, spent a whole summer prior to me going to rookie camp, um, working out with me every single day, for two hours a day yeah. on Really, and I'll tell you, bro, he kicked my butt every single day. I could not beat Mo Layton. Even mm-hmm. when he was in his 40s, mm-hmm. I could not beat him playing basketball. We would play one-on-one full court. That was that was his that was part of his one of his conditions that he had to play one-on-one full court. And Mo Layton had a move that he put on me every single time that I could not stop. He just massive worked his way to the middle of the key, middle of the basket. And he had a like a hook shot that he would separate. He had, a, he had an ability to put his arm up and create space between you and him so he could shoot his shot. And he made it every single time. I mean, I knew it was coming and I couldn't stop it, but he was teaching me how to get that one shot, that go-to shot. Um, and I've learned that by playing with Mo Layton. Mo Layton would make me do layup drills, full court, to the Harlem Globetrotters. You know that song? Yeah, the song, the little song. theme song, right, yeah. Theme song. So imagine doing that to the theme song, and the song played five times. That was, the, that was Mo Layton's way of getting you into shape. He made you do layups without putting the ball on the floor. Mm-hmm. So you had to run to catch him. He was in great shape. And I spent my whole summer preparing for rookie camp with Mo Layton. And by having that training, when I got to rookie camp, once I got past uh, um, the the first cut, Mm -hmm. I wound up coming off the bench and wound up starting doing rookie camp, averaging 16 points a game in rookie camp. and I owe, I owe all that to Mo Layton, who prepared me uh, to be that type of player in the pros. 16 points a game. I was, uh, I was playing with Pearl Washington. Yeah. was the camp with me. Um, and at that year, in the rookie camp, it was, uh, we had, I was playing against David Wingate. I was playing against, uh, it was so many great players back then. And it was a lot of veterans who also was trying to make that cut. So, and, it was only two pos- two positions open at the time uh, for the Nets. So it was Duran Cook who was uh, on the cutting blocks, and Otis Bursong who was wavering whether yeah. he was going to come back or not. So, um, and unfortunately, I got hurt uh, right before Veterans Camp. I uh, tore my knee up in uh, rookie camp. So my chances of uh, they kept me around, but my chances of making the team just mm-hmm. diminished right then and there. Once you get hurt in the NBA, back in those days, mm-hmm. you were done. Yeah. Before we talk about that for a second, just just getting drafted. Like, you remember where you was that day and that phone call? You remember all uh, that? So, if, I don't know. I mean, I mean, you may find it hard to believe I didn't watch the draft. Okay. Because I, um, I wasn't sure if I was going to get picked or not. Um, because when I came out with so many great players, man, and um, I, I didn't, my, my whole career, I didn't, read the, I didn't read any articles about myself. Uh, I didn't cut any articles out. I never, I never got into what was in the paper or what was, on, what was said about me. I just enjoyed playing the game. I just, I, I hated losing. So the W was more important to me. So I never watched the draft. And when I got drafted, my coach called me and said, hey, you, you, you know, you made the last round of the draft, man. Get yourself ready. And right then and then, I moved from D.C. back to New Jersey and started training with Mo lady. My family was all excited. You know, they just, everything that I've worked for right. was finally coming to fruition. And my dad was, my dad was thrilled because everything he put in to get me to that level, he finally had a chance to see his son get drafted and the possibility of making the NBA team. So um, it was it was an exciting moment, man. We didn't we didn't celebrate, we didn't have a celebration party. You know, it was just uh, you all right, you, you get get ready to work, you know, right. you know, get your get your work on. 
it's not a time to celebrate. It's a time for you to start working. So that's that's how I started for me. Uh, and you have interesting you share that story about Mo Layton. Uh, I'm scheduled to talk with him too, so I may I had to make a mention though. I'm gonna bring I'm gonna bring that up to him. See. See if he remembers. So I'm, I'm actually that. honored. I actually got interviewed before Mo Layton. <laughs> nah, that's funny. That's funny. <laughs> now nah, you you talk about it's like how heartbreaking that um that knee injury. I mean, yeah, it was um, you know, it was it was another setback, man. It was this, you know, when you play this game, there's always a possibility that. You may make it and you may not. Um, it could be an injury that prevents you from making it, or it could be politics, right. or it could be drafted by the wrong team, and that happens a lot. You get drafted by the wrong team, and you may have the talent, but just, you just don't fit that profile. So I went through surgery. I had the surgery uh, performed by the Washington Wizards because uh, Buck Williams was the uh, player rep at the time, and he said, whatever you do, don't let the next doctor work on you. <laughs> yeah. he said they'll say you're ready faster than you are go find another team doctor to work um on your knee this way they can't rush you back so i took his advice and so i went and had the surgery i went down to dc had the surgery i rehabbed down there as well okay and um so i just a little helpful hint and you know anybody that's thinking about making the pros and you get hurt and you think you think that you should get a shot, a shot back with the same team? Yeah, it doesn't happen. So um, I went out. So that summer, I went out to um, it was a CBA back then. Mm -hmm. So I've actually went out to a CBA team up in uh, Albany, New York, at the time. And I went up there and I played. I had the opportunity to play, but I, at that point in time, man, I said I don't want to do this anymore. Um, I don't want to play CBA. I, mm -hmm. I said, if I can't make it, I don't want to do this anymore. And at that point in time, that's when I said, uh, uh, no, thank you. I'm done. And mm -hmm. I, I stopped playing. I stopped competing on a professional level at that point in time when I knew I couldn't make the pros, man. I, I didn't want to, I didn't want to go to CBA rock. I don't have any regrets doing that, but I just didn't want to be that guy because when I was in veterans camp, there were a lot of guys who was 30 in their late thirties that were in and out of the CBA. And I was like, ah, oh, man, I don't want to be like that. 30 years old, no career, and still trying to make the NBA. What are the chances you making in that 30 when there's guys like me coming in at 21? You know, they're not going to take you at 30. Don't mm -hmm. take me at 21. I'm cheaper than you. So I didn't want to fall into that category. So I just, I just stepped away from the game. Now, did you stop completely summer leagues, all that stuff? You stopped completely cold turkey? Or? No, I couldn't go cold turkey. Okay. Um, I played in a lot of park leagues. Um, I actually uh, played in Brantford Park mm -hmm. over the summer, in Brantford Park, Anwar Park. I okay. uh, played over in New York a lot. Um, a lot of ex-Georgetown players used to come over the city. We used to, we used to play pickup ball over there. Okay. You know, I, I continued to play for a long time, competitively for a long time. And then it got to a point where I realized I can't get hurt anymore and I have to work, so I figured... Mm -hmm. I dialed it back probably when I was probably about 25. So maybe for, for, for four years, I still competed Okay. Um, in the local parks and the rec leagues. Now, you know what that's saying? Obviously, family, everything, your own family, your own, all that stuff starts to take shape as well, too. So I know, you know, other responsibilities probably played a role as far as like, let me get on and do something else with my life here. Obviously, basketball is a huge part of my life, but you know, again, it just kind of snowballed into you probably getting on with other things as well, too, I'm sure. Yeah. Um, um, once I realized, well, actually, I got married um, to my wife, who has been with, who actually been married for 33 years to today. So kudos to her for putting up with me for 33 years. So I'm yeah. thankful for that. So I got I got married. And um, at that point in time, we, I, we already had a kid. Um, and we had a daughter by the name of Shandice and we, that, I had to stop playing basketball. I had to get a job and I had to take care of my family. And so that's when my life started changing. That's when the education that's right. took over for me. Um, and it allowed for me to actually have some great jobs and, you know, and, and work, for some, work for some great companies. 
Um, but it was a challenge transitioning. I don't know how most guys do it, transitioning from playing ball now to now not playing ball to now being a responsible individual or, you know, being able to contribute to society, man. So it was, a, it was, it was a, it was a difficult transition to give up the game, but I knew I had to do it because I made this commitment to be married and to raise a family. Yeah. And then even with that being said, I do like to slip in a question to just like, what uh, being a father, what does fatherhood mean to you? There's no book for it. Yeah. There's really, you know, I, you know, it's, I tried to emulate my dad's uh, philosophy with, with raising my kids. I don't think that was a good idea. <laughs> I really don't because uh, it was just a different time. I mean, you know, you know my father was, in, you know, like I said, I had a lot of military, you know, kind of upbringing. So my dad was very strict about certain things. And, you know, I, I, was, I was strict, but I wasn't, I couldn't be my father. I realized that, you know, because I didn't have that, that basic training that he had, but it was, it was a difficult transition to being responsible for someone other than yourself. Mm -hmm. um, raising my daughter and, and my son at the time, uh, it, was, it was a challenge for me. And um, it made me grow. It made me understand, you know, other, you know, how to understand kids and how to be sympathetic to things that I probably would have never been sympathetic towards. Um, it made me a better person. It made me, it, it gave me a reason to get up every single day uh, and to provide for my, my family, just like my father showed me. So um, that part was the easy part, but raising um, my kids was, it was a challenge because it was different learning, different material that you know, I had to relearn and video games were coming out then and computers and you know all this social stuff was starting to happen. I, I didn't know how to adjust to that. So it was difficult. And um, I don't even know how the parents do it today, but it was it was a challenge for me raising my uh, two kids and getting them off to uh, through high school and, and, and into college as well. Yeah. And it's and that's a selfish question of mine because I became a father late. I got a I have a seven year old um, daughter. So I waited forever to have him. So, so, you know, I always like to kind of like ask that question to, you know, those who've done it, been there, done that. So that sometimes I, that's the selfish part of me gets the best of me. So now I appreciate that too. Cause I mean, there's, there's no, uh, there's no manual, there's no blueprint for it. You know, uh, um, yeah. I would doubt, so I would honestly say, Ben, you have a daughter and I have one too. I still have a daughter, but I would say, I, I think most men, are very very protective of their daughters. And so, oh yeah, absolutely. And so I just, I just, I, I can only imagine if you grew up like I did. You, you used to, you know, certain things. And so, don't don't spare the rod when she when she introduce you to her her, her, her boyfriend as she get older. <laughs> yeah, I know, I know. I was in uh in preschool. I'm going to pick her up. She playing with a with a, little, with a little boy. I'm getting already upset right right then and there. I'm like, man, she only. Three, four years old, man. I, I got a long way to go. I got to control this and keep my blood pressure down. I mean, I can, yeah. So, Good nah. <laughs> nah, nah, nah. I appreciate it. Now, even to kind of spin it back, like, with, even with sports and everything, like, what is what is sports giving you that stuck with you to this day? Um, teamwork. Okay. Teamwork. Um, commitment. Um, Follow through, discipline, never say die, mm -hmm. never quit, fight to the end, yeah. never accept losing, work always out, always believe in outworking your opponent, especially if you're playing away. That was always another big thing, you know. Coach Sines used to tell us you got to play twice as hard, playing against the referees and the fans and the team. So, um, and you know what? I've I've learned to trust my teammates um, when I played because I know a lot of people said I was really good. I didn't really think I was that good, to be honest with you. I really, you know, I thought there was a lot of other players that you know had a lot of talent, and and I think the reason why I was so successful because my teammates were successful. So when when I always try to get my teammates involved in a game because I always felt that if it if I got them involved, then it would take the pressure off of me. And who wants to have the pressure the whole game? You know, I just 
So I've always made sure that my teammates, we all made sure we was on the same page. We all knew our role. We all trusted one another. And I think that's what made my basketball career so successful is that we, we had a trust for one another and we respected each other's ability to do certain things. And I think that's what gave me really the edge. I had great teammates that I played with. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and people don't realize that. I mean, even, you know, unfortunately, not even unfortunately, there's going to be a star or whoever's supposed to be out of the group. But it's a, it's a, it's a team thing, especially with basketball, especially with basketball. I mean, there's five of you guys out there. And, and again, like I said, someone might get more light than the other one. But when it's all said and done, your team is just as intricate and as important to your success as, than anybody else. Definitely. Yeah, I, 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 I definitely think, especially when you get to college, everybody's an all-star, man. Yeah. Everybody. Mm -hmm. So um, you have to learn to uh, make it work for you and trust your teammates because everybody that's there is on a scholarship. They're there for a reason. So um, it's not like you're the talented. You might be, like you say, you might be the star, but those other guys can make you make or break you. So you have to kind of get them on board with you and get them to actually believe in what you believe in. So I really did trust my teammates to help me be successful. And it's interesting you say that, and that, that plays another part in all facets of our life. You talk about our family life, so you're in our home life, all of us being on the same page, you know, as much as we know our wives run the show, we still gotta be on the same page with them and, you know, in our careers and everything else, that whole team aspect. I mean, everyone's gotta be on the same page. Someone might, do something better than the other person, but when it's all said and done, it's a team. It's a team thing. Yeah, well, I, well, I noticed you humbled yourself and said your wife is uh, in charge, which I think we all should admit to that, especially if you want to. <laughs> you know, I don't, my my son always said, "What about the men? Don't worry about that. Just do, if, if you can keep your wife happy, then your life will definitely be more pleasant. That's I can guarantee you that." Yeah. So. Yeah, my wife and I, 33 years together, man, and, it's, um, and it, it, it was definitely um, some up and down, ups and downs in our relationships. And and I honestly believe sports helped me with that, you know, being able to deal with the ups and downs and recognize when you might have had a bad game, like you might have had a bad night, night with, uh, with, your, with your wife, you might have said something you weren't supposed to say. Great, yeah. You have to humble yourself and say, hey, you know, it's, I'm sorry, or it's not that big of a deal, so. I commend you for saying that. Yeah, nah, nah, I know what time it is. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> nah, I know it definitely know what time it is. Now, nah, what, uh, what I generally do, again, like I said, I, I'm, Troy, I'm appreciative of this too. And I just, again, just a little bit more to your, of your time, if that's okay. Yeah, 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 I'm here for you. Cool, cool. So what I do, I obviously, my little thing, I would like to just throw people on the spot with some other stuff here, have some fun, you know, while right, wrong, or indifferent with the response, but it's your response. You know, while being a Jersey guy, you park away at a turnpike. Uh, right now, my job is having me using 280. Ah, so. Okay, okay, okay. <laughs> All right, cool, cool. You all, as far as I know, being in Newark or what have you there, or Newark East Orange, but I had to ask you this, and I, I didn't ask earlier that you were sharing that Scott story, so I'm just kind of digress for a sec. Now, when you made the decision to go to Scott just 40 years later, Who's, did you have to use somebody's address or you live, lived in? Oh, man. <laughs> what are you talking about? All right, there we go. <laughs> did, did they recruit back in the day? Oh, hey, a lot of things went on. Yeah, a lot of things went on. <laughs> All right, yeah. got my answer. Cool. <laughs> now, well, yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, as far as... um. Even in you know, your Jersey life, just kind of take you back um, as far as, I don't know if you hung out or whatever, but the bogeys or the peppermint? Zanzibar. You can even go to the Zans, okay. How about sensations? You do sensations too? Sensations too, yeah. Okay, okay, okay. Cheetahs. Okay, yeah, yeah. Nah, I've heard about all these spots. Well, bogeys was like, uh, you know, right. but the Zanzibar was the spot. All right, so I'm even take you universal, or Bambergs. I'm gonna hit you with a Bamberg. Uh, more universal because that's all we could afford. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay, okay. Now, uh, obviously, you spent time in DC and obviously New Jersey. House or go go? Uh, while I was in DC? No, nah, just in general. Yeah, house or go go? Oh, 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 I'm a, I'm a house head, man. That's it. I'm it. 
But while I was in DC, it was definitely go go. Okay, okay. Go. Uh, Scott or or the Valley? Ooh. Two great coaches, man. I mm -hmm. would hate to say either or. I would say uh, someone have to would pick me. You know, it's like you pick Charles Barkley or you take the little kid in the commercial. So I'm hoping that they would pick me. I'm hoping that one of those coaches would pick me. I don't know, man. Scott, Scott was so it was it was great to be there, man. It was just the talent, the talent at, uh, in practice was unbelievable. And great times um, made it so much fun. And But at the Valley, I had my back to the basket. So what do you think? What do you think? I'm going to leave that for you. I, mean, I, would, I would honestly, I would say, as much as I enjoy playing for Ted Fiore, I would say great times um, gave me a different aspect of the game. Mm -hmm. uh, so if I, I would say I, I, I know Coach Fury, I hope he forgives me, but great times, man. He, okay. he, he played. He, he he definitely made it out. He made it right for me. So he actually allowed for me to be very creative and to be the player I was in my my last few years of high school. So Clipper Scott. Okay. Best game you ever played in your life on any level. Um, grammar school. Okay. Score 50 points. Yeah. Basket, basket like an ocean, I'm sure. It was like an ocean, man. I was uh, 50 points in the game, man. It was, uh, I don't even know how I scored 50 points, but at the end of the game, it was like, you scored 50 points. I was like, okay, 50 points. I, really, I went home and told my parents, like, my father, like, you ain't scoring no 50 points. Like, I scored 50 points. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Was, no, huh? No, go ahead, go ahead. No, so that's because I told my father I scored 50 points because I was playing basketball with you guys. Mm -hmm. So it was easy to get 50 points against an eighth grader who didn't have my physical strength. So, yeah. So back there, they have a, a box of one, triangle and two, or nothing on you? <laughs> they tried, it didn't work. It didn't work. Not, it didn't not work. that day. It didn't work. It was just one of those days. Yeah. yeah. It was one of those days. It was like the ocean. Mm. Any game you like to have back? Um, weak weight versus Valley. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. That, that, that county game. Yeah. 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 I would like to have that one back. Now, you mentioned it was interesting. You talked about uh, Mo Layton and teaching. And he had like a go to move. I'm just going to ask you did you ever develop a go to move? I did. Um, I, I was, uh, you know, very, I was, well, right hand was, most people played me to my right. Okay. So, because that was my dominant side. So I would always jab to my right because they always anticipated that and do a crossover and go to the middle mm -hmm. of the basket yeah. on the right side. That was my, and, and get in the middle and get in the middle of the three point lane, uh, the three point zone and um, a three second zone and then Hit that little baby jumper. Yeah, yeah. That was that was that was that was that was my bread and butter right there. Get to the middle of the basket, mm -hmm. and hitting the jumper. Who, who was the toughest person um to guard you? Like you was like, oh, I got him today, or this person who was anybody you deemed to be tough as far as guarding you with? Uh I would say Terrence Stansberry. I don't know if that name means. Remember the name? Play for the Pacers, dunk contest, Statue of Liberty. Yeah. yeah. I played against Terrence Stansberry in high school and in college. Okay. But he was, he was, he was like six five, six six, and he could he could do it all, man. And uh yeah, he was tough to guard and play against. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Best team you ever been on? Uh I'm going to say my junior year, 1981. Okay. Clipper Scott. Yeah. I mean, that, that was a team, man. Mm -hmm. I, I never worked so hard in the practice with, I mean, we had Mike Brown and we had two other guys that were like 6'5", six, 6'6". Six, six. Mm -hmm. so, and we had some, we had some big guards, man. We, it was, it was very competitive. That was a tough team to be in. It was a, it was a tough team to make. Yeah. I nah, sound like you. I nah, sound like you. Yeah. We only lost three games. Remember those losses? Yes, I do. Yeah. 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 Uh, 
North teams. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. I'll leave it right there. I'll leave it right there. I don't need you to try to pick up a basketball or go find anybody. So, <laughs> <laughs> now, uh, someone who should have made it at any level, whether it's college or the pros, is someone who should have made it. Um, do my error? Any error? I, I'll say yeah, error. I'll say yeah, error. Um, that I played against that. Um, what's the uh, what's the uh, the guard from uh, Virginia? Odell. I played against him my uh, freshman sophomore year. It was at University of Virginia when they had Ralph Sampson. And okay. Um, I can't think of his name. Uh, if not, I can also think of another guy. I, I thought Red Bruin should have made it too from uh, from Syracuse. Okay. Yeah. I thought he had talent, uh, but you know it's, it's a tough game, man. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you the uh, you the best to ever come out of Scott. No, nope. I won't. I won't. I won't. I won't. I won't acknowledge that at all. There's a guy by the name of Gary Garland. I don't know if anybody knows that name, but mm-hmm. and there were other players that were successful. Maybe not as successful, but you got to keep in mind. So when I played, I had Mike Brown. Mm-hmm. So you know those guys who came out before me. You know, like a Gary Garland, he didn't have a Mike Brown. I had Mike Brown six eight. So, and the guy that besides Mike was like six five, six six. So it was, you know, I, those guys gave me tools to be successful. So I won't say I was the best player that came. I, I don't even think I was the best player that came out of the county. Yeah, I, yeah. I think there were other players that were, you know, that was tough like me. And just didn't, you know, just didn't have that teammate beside him. <laughs> so yeah. Now you play a, a winner take all game. This is um, from your era. Who who you bring it with you? Who's your who's your star five? Winner takes all. Who 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 you put on your star five? Um, I'm gonna say the team that I played with my junior year, which would be Andre Adams, Keith Rob, Mike Brown, mm-hmm. uh, myself. Uh, I think sometimes it was either Ivan Davis or Tony Jones. I don't know. It depends on how times one to make the team, but. If I had to pick a six six guy, it would be Tony Jones or Ivan Davis. That team right there alone could be any team that I ever played with or against, man. Yeah, yeah. You take it. You five take, guys right there. You taking them all day. I'm taking them all day. Yeah. Three um up to this point of your life. Three of the best moments of your life up to this point. Um. You don't have, have to rank. Don't have to rank them, but just no, no. Without I'm going to tell you without hesitation. I'm going to tell you, marriage is the best thing that happened to me. I'm going to be honest with you. Yeah, it made me a better person. Um, fatherhood, all the things that come with it for 33 years, it made me a better person. I, my wife has definitely enhanced my life, so I can honestly say that. I would say um, <clears throat> having kids, mm-hmm. having my daughter and son. And um, and and I'll be honest with you, I have a grandkid, so I'm gonna say that's you know, yeah, those are the three best moments in my life. I'm I'm a family guy, so I appreciate those moments. But my grandkids, if I, I'm not gonna tell you which order I'm gonna put them in, but but my grandkids definitely uh, it plays a big role in my life right now. That's that's good stuff, man. Now, anything you would you would do different? Um. Uh, no, I don't have any regrets. Mm-hmm. I don't. I look. I do. I do look in the rearview mirror from time to time. About, human. You're human. Yeah. Well, because you know, I was. I was there. I was. I was. I was at the dance. I was there. I was. I was. I had a uniform on. Yeah. I had, I had a New Jersey Nets uniform on. So I took. I, I took a photo in a uniform. So I was there. You know. And so I do look. I do look in the mirror. I was like, man, what? I don't. I, can I only could imagine what it'd been like. I sat on the bench at, at games. Oh, I was hurt, but I, I was there. So yeah, that's 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 uh, that's the part. That's the only thing I look back on is like, man, I was right there. But mm-hmm. I don't have any regrets yeah. because I could have pursued more, but I I felt comfortable stepping away from it. Mm-hmm. No, nah, and I think you know just having that peace. You yeah, because you, you're the one that got to live with it when it's all said and done. Absolutely. Yeah. Best part about being Troy Webster? Um, 
from a basketball standpoint, I would say the, uh, how people treat me, how people, especially in the sports world, how they always, you know, recognizing my basketball talent. I would say that that's a, that's a blessing um, to have, to know that people recognize my, my basketball skills. I honestly, I can honestly tell you, if I really didn't think I was that good, man, that the way people talk about me and give me um, accolades, I really didn't think I was good. I said, man, there's so many other good players that were out there with me. It's just like, I just, I used the game. I used it to my advantage and I took advantage of all the tools that, that came with it. Mike Brown. Yes. Great times. Mm-hmm. You know, Ted Fiore. Mm-hmm. Uh, I just, I t- Cleo Hill, mm-hmm. Mo Layton. I just yeah. took advantage. I just took advantage of the of the tools. My father exposing me. Mr. I, I could go down the list. Mr. Miles, Mr. Oliver, Kenny Macklin. You know, all those guys. You know, taught me the game, and I just kind of just I just use their uh, skills, their knowledge, and I used it for my own personal gain. And mm-hmm. that's I've always felt like I don't need to brag. I'm I'm gonna go out here. Play this game, and you're gonna know you played against me. Mm-hmm. That was Absolutely. my idea. Absolutely, you're gonna know you played against me. Mm-hmm. Now, what would this uh, this Troy Webster this time in your life? What would you tell that 17, 18 year old senior? What advice would you give that Troy? Um, so I've always wanted to be a lawyer. Okay, I've always wanted to be a lawyer. Besides basketball a lawyer is something I've always wanted to be. I would tell that Troy to read more. Yeah. Yeah. We to read to to expand your uh your reading because lawyers have to read a lot. And uh I would definitely tell that Troy that, you know, read some books that are not really of interest so to you. Um a lot of the uh classic books I would tell that Troy to read. That's what I would tell him. Yeah. Yeah, and nah, you'd be surprised. I know we get caught up. I mean, obviously, as the the actual newspaper and all them stuff stuff has become a little more obsolete computers and anything else, but reading is, is, is so important. And I mean, and obviously, just you mentioned the whole thing, wanting to be a lawyer here. They stay in the book, they stay in files, everything else here. Nah, that, that's that's great advice here. Can I just be nosy before I wrap this up? What does that sign say you know, like behind you? I'm going to pull it out for you because I, okay. I, I have all types of quotes in my uh, basement. This okay. is my man cave. Mm-hmm. This is for your audience. I don't know if I'm too close. Now you just, I don't know. Okay. Absolutely. Yeah, couldn't, couldn't say it better here. Yeah. yeah I couldn't say it better here. And, what I say to that is actually just to you here, uh, Troy. Like I said, I've you know heard stories. Obviously, me being a little, a little, little younger, but just still just hearing stories about your exploits and and everything else here. I think just um, I'm still just taken back having the opportunity to sit here and talk and talk with you here, um, and just obviously to hear even a little glimpse of your world here for this last little bit of time here, and just how important. I mean, you kept bringing up your father, you know, just how important that foundation he laid down to you here. Talked about your family, talked about, you know, everything else here, your trials and some of them hurdles even, but you knew what the importance of a lot of things was, i.e. finishing school and getting, making sure you get that piece of paper while you was there, you know, on, on their dime. And as you kind of just wrapped up, just talking about, you know, you just knew how to use your resources, whether it was Coach Times, whether it was Mo Layton, or again, whoever it was, but you just knew how to use your resources in regards to the game of basketball. And this allowed you, it's taking you places you probably would have never thought. Even to this day, I'm sure basketball plays a big part in your life here. Not as much as back then, but I'm sure it still plays a part in your life. Hey, I'm talking to you. I, I found you somehow. So obviously, you know, it still plays a part in your life here. But I just want to say thank you just for all the joy that you've given, you know, tons of people throughout your life here with that game. And then even outside of the game, I can only imagine just listening to you and just how solid of a guy you are here, just the people that know you. I just want to say thank you on, on their behalf, just, you know, the the guy that you are here. And like I said, I'm just so honored just to be and taken back to even be sitting here with you and 
like I said, just getting a tiny glimpse into your world here. So I want to say thank you to, you know, um, for all you've done, you being officially you. Somehow, some way, indirectly, 10, 15 years down the road later, made me help you become officially me here. And I, I just wanted to, honestly, Troy, thank you so much. And I, I really mean that from the bottom of my heart here, you know, so I, I wanted to say thank you. Then. I appreciate it. I mean, this is a, this is a wonderful platform. Um, I'm glad you're doing it because it gives guys like myself and, you know, an opportunity really to tell their story. And it's almost like, it's almost like therapy, you know, just to, to, to be able to, you know, sit in front of you, this computer and share my life with you and your audience. And hopefully you'll share with other folks so they get a chance to see it, that, um, that it was a lot of work that went into uh, becoming Troy Webster, um, not just on the court, but off the court as well. And that, um, that I use the game. And it was my father's always, my father's mission was to use the game and let the game use you. And to make sure that you knew that ball was going to stop bouncing. And what were you going to do when, when you can't bounce that ball anymore? And how are you going to provide for yourself and how are you going to contribute to society? So with that being said, man, it's just, I'm glad, I'm glad it's brothers like you that are giving people like me. And I truly always wanted to tell my story and I'm glad, I'm glad we connected. Um, there's probably, I probably could go on and on about my life, but I appreciate you just giving me this little glimpse of just telling people that I thank everyone that I ever played against. I really do think that those guys made me a better athlete because they brought the best out of me. Mm -hmm. All those North teams, East Orange, Orange, all those teams I played against, prepared me to be that the gentleman I am today, man. And I'm thankful for that. Yeah, no, definitely, definitely. No, no, Troy, it's a small world, obviously. And like I said, I everyone that I, I done met, you know, I, I might have said this, you know, online or offline here, like I said, don't be surprised you hear from me again. You know, <laughs> you know, what I mean? like I said, it's a small world and the case may be here, though. Like, but like I said, thank you. Thank I, you. Yeah, I thank you. And I know I'm quite sure everybody who said across from you said, man, thank you. And they truly mean that. Yeah. Yeah. I know. And and again, I know we can exchange pleasantries back and forth, as I mentioned in the beginning, but I think I get more, I probably get more out of this than anybody. I think my wife, if anything, she keep hearing me talk about each person I talk to here. She probably, about, obviously I got to take care of her and do something nice, but I tell her me being a Jersey boy, especially in Essex County, just all that, athletes, all the establishments, business, all the people that just became something out of, that's that's home to me. And, and I mean, she knew what she got when she um when she decided to say I do. I'm a Jersey boy and she knows that. And like I said, um, and this here just again, this has just been great. I mean, like I said, just having an opportunity to talk with people such as yourself and everybody else here. Like I'm just people I never thought I'd ever meet in my life here. So like I said, I I'm I'm taking back by all of this. Well, if you ever need to talk to any other athletes, I'm quite sure I could forward you some numbers. Uh, no, I keep that. I definitely keep that in mind. And um, uh, like I said, I got a good. It's a good chance you might not might not be the last you hear from me. I appreciate that. Wish you all good health, for everybody, your family. Continue um, being the guy that you are. And like I said, thank you. Thank you. Uh, take care. You too. All right. So if I get a little choked up, and um, like I said, as I mentioned, the, the Troy have. Thank you to everybody just giving me the opportunity here to kind of live my fan moment, my childhood, even my adulthood, just hearing, you know, some of the jewels that I've taken from probably everyone that I've talked to, family members, to everybody else here. So, um, and Troy, like I said, thank you, man. Thank you so much. Like I said, just have an opportunity to put the face with the name, the articles, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, Troy, thank you for this. And with that being said, I'm just going to slide on out. I put my hand over my heart. That means I feel you. Yeah. <laughs>